สวัสดีครับทุกทุกท่านนะฮะ professional student นะครับวันนี้เนี่ยเราก็มีความดีนะฮะสนเสนอ lecture series ซึ่งจริงๆแล้วอันนี้มันเป็น series ฉลองครบรอบ90ปีของคณะนะครับในเรื่องเกี่ยวกับ artificial design for society 2024นะตลอดทั้งปีเนี่ยก็จะมีครั้งนะครับครั้งนี้ก็เป็นครั้งหนึ่งที่เราเชิญผู้เชี่ยวชาญจากหลากหลายสาขาทั้งระดับชาติและระดับชาตินะครับเพื่อที่จะมาแชร์ความรู้แนวคิดนะฮะเกี่ยวกับการออกแบบและการศึกษาวิจัยนะครับสำหรับผู้ที่เข้าร่วมฟังในครั้งนี้ที่เป็นสาขาเล็กสาขาต่างๆนะที่มีใบอนุญาตเนี่ยท่านสามารถได้รับจะสนแทกมูลต่อนะครับจากการลงทะเบียนข้างล่างชั้นชั้นข้างล่างที่มีการเซ็นชื่อนะครับคณะสถาปัตย์ขอขอบคุณบริษัทสุนทรไทยที่ให้การสนับสนุนกิจการครั้งนี้นะครับจากนี้ไปขอเรียนเชิญท่านคณะบดีผู้จัดสรรการสายทรัพย์สุดกลับเลยนะครับครับสวัสดีครับเราต้องชื่อปัตติวัตเตอร์ทีวันกอนิโอสติ As a representative of Sri Lanka University, I, um, we are very pleased to have an um, assistant professor to you and Kim um, to have a, a special lecture for us. Um, in fact, I, I don't know her personally. I just met her today. It's <laughs> the so first day I met her. But then after reviewing the, uh, the work that she's done in the past, it's very interesting that uh, she's had a great genes between academics and professional. Because besides um, working as a professional, Last year, designer, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She also published a book, which is her interest, about the authority, um, like an authentic major, right? And which is the topic that um, she will tell us today about this thing. So I think you will enjoy the lecture and uh, give a lot of uh, good time for, for discussion afterward. So please, so I'll give them stage for her to give us a lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to introduce uh, Professor Nguyen Kim. She's a founding principal of a park camp, uh, professional uh, firm, pushing the boundaries. She is a co-founder with Eugene Park in Rotterdam after winning the Taiwan Chi Chi Club for in 2004. She completed diverse projects like Seoul Museum Craft Art in 2021, ongoing research at the GSD focused on landscape architecture roles in climate change. She's also co authored an alternative field of uh, nature in 2016, exploring urbanism in East Asia. She is selected as a designer, design leader of Next Generation by the Korean Ministry of Commerce appointing so public architects. And she also served as a park design commissioner of the new city in 2008-2010, uh, engaging in prestigious teaching role at the uh, university, so National University, appointing Winchester and Distinguished Visiting Professor at Norton School of Architects in Ohio. She holds a Master of Landscape Architecture, PhD, <coughs> and Bachelor of Architecture agriculture with distinction from some national university. Um, in fact, uh, last summer, this is the first time I met her in Belmont, Massachusetts. I had the pleasure to meet her through the introduction of Professor Gary Gilbert, chair of the landscape department at the GSD. To my surprise, uh, I discovered that her husband was also a GSD alumni and a former colleague Society of mine in early 2000s. I feel that this shared connection strengthened our professional relationship. Since then, we have maintained communications, and I, and I extend an invitation for her to participate in an inner studio instructed by our board leader and GSD alum, Professor Ken Jongsula. She traveled to Thailand this is second time. The first time, she saw me in places. I made connection with her GSD classmate like uh, Bob Atapon Kokopsanli from Trump, Kuna Kwanapon Kwanrapa uh, from Pilan, Ochakon, and several others <coughs> to continue her current research focused on professional climate uh, professional practice in Southeast Asia. 
and particularly concerning climate change. We anticipate that her involvement in this lecture and studio will foster future collaborations opportunities. And she just told me that uh, last week she just won the design competitions. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about it. So. Yeah. <laughs> This is a floating stage competitions. Um, and in fact, we are very really fortunate that she showed that project. The first time we were here, the first time we were here, she presented this project. Please welcome Professor Julie Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. Hi, my name is Jung Yun Kim. Uh, it's so, uh, I'm just so honored and pleased to be here. Um, and thank you, Ajahn Shusek and uh, Ajahn Ken, um, to really uh, help me to uh, be here. And also thank you, Dean, for coming and all other guests um, just to uh, be here today. Thank you very much. And um, just, just to start with, Chula Hong Kong has really good reputation in, in G Harvard GSD that um, almost every class um, have students, one or, one or two students from Chula, and then they are usually the best of the class, really. I'm not saying that because I'm here, but that, that is true. <laughs> so um, um, my colleague professors are also very excited that I'm giving lecture here um, so that uh, we even promote more good students from Chula. So uh, please let me know if any of you want to apply to GSD after your great education uh, from Chula. Um, also, I want to mention some of my uh, beloved Thai friends, uh, personal and professional friends, just to start with. So as Shusak mentioned, uh, Pok from Trok, Atapon Kopuk Sanki. So he was my classmate uh, when I was at the GSD as a student in, from 1998 to 2000. It's a long time ago. Uh, and also, I know she's not from Chula, but uh, Papimo Sunti Tim, who passed away last year. Um, so people call, call her um, Art. And she's the one who made my GSD life less miserable. So um, I. Um, I adore her, which she's here. And um, Kachakam Borakom from of uh, Land Process. So uh, she is, as you know, she's now a world star. And I think she's doing great thing for the profession of landscape architecture, just reminding people that we landscape architects are supposed to lead this crisis. But I think all of this are really happening, originated from Chula. So I think all of you really need to be very um, proud to be part of um, Chula Long Kong. And also my former students and my uh, designer, uh, Jen, is here today also. <laughs> Thank you. And my uh, students from GSD, Peak, Pam, and Pai, they're, they, they were the, the best of the class. So I was really happy to um, be with those students from Chula also. And also, not to mention, I mean, I don't have to really mention all other Thai great landscape architects, P Landscape and Shima, they're all doing great work. And I really introduced their work to GSD through my uh, studio and also seminars. I'm just so happy to be here today, really. Um, so today, my, my, the topic of my, my lecture is alternative nature. So I've been using this lecture title for quite a long time, but I never really use same PPT PowerPoint for other lectures. So I um, usually try to modify the slides, uh, fitting the context more. So let me start with the, the work of uh, Pam and Pai of my studio, who was in my studio last semester of uh, spring 20, 2023. Um, so the studio was about Antwerp, Belgium. And um, I always start by really make a deep, deep section going into like 100 meter deep um, at the maximum. So Pam and Pai did just a great job uh, of studying the history of the built form of Antwerp. And um, they researched a lot and then all the subterranean condition of Antwerp and then 
from the very uh, like a, a, from the 16th century, where when Antwerp was one of the world's richest city in the world, to the current situation where the city is trying to build a two new underground highway uh, to uh, mitigate really bad chronic um, the traffic. Traffic. So they did this built form, built form study uh, to see what is the kind of history of the engagement between the above and below ground. So everyone really uh, referred to their sectional drawing uh, to locate the current situation of the Antwerp. I just want to start by their work um, because I think you should be really proud of your colleague. So before I begin uh, to talk about before I begin to talk about um, alternative nature, then maybe we can start off of saying what is the nature that you are thinking. So I think we can, you can actually make conversation about nature with anyone of any age, of any uh, nationality, because everyone has their own uh, concept or experience of knowledge about nature, even though they could be different, uh, right? So. Um, Nature is a commonality, but at the same time, na nature is also very uh, different by uh, person by person and country by country and culture by culture. So, um, but especially because I'm a landscape architect, I know some of you are architect, but especially for landscape architect, we are supposed to deal with nature because as you all know, the profession of landscape architecture um, in America started uh, but and also Europe start by kind of mimicking the nature in the congested city, right? Because many people at that time, after the industrialization, people didn't really have enough time or money to go outside of the city to enjoy the nature, right? So that's the kind of start point of the, the professional landscape architecture to create kind of fake nature in the city for people to kind of, you know, relax and get the experience of nature. So uh, we are supposed to deal with nature, um, and sometimes we have to fake nature and we have to create experience of nature or uh, modifying it sometimes. So uh, this is kind of uh, the title that I uh, inspired by. There's a book called How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World, uh, written by a, a geologist in America. So I, I think it just as a professional, I think we all need to think about uh, just replacing this landscape architect uh, with your own profession, uh, how as a professional we need to contribute to help save the world. No one can actually save the world by themselves, like a, you know, a Marvel movie, but we can actually help save the world, right? So this is the kind of topic that um, I also recently uh, think about. So uh, what is alternative nature then? So uh, this is a term that um, I've been this is a term that um, I've been uh, using uh, from 2007. So we wrote this uh, essay uh, titled Gangnam Alternative Nature, The Experience of Nature Without Park uh, for the book called Asian Authority. So uh, in this essay, there was a first time that we kind of coined the term saying alternative nature, uh, that which means so um, after like a 10 years of living abroad, like a studying and working uh, outside of Korea, uh, also Yunjin and myself, uh, we came back to Korea 2006. And then, you know, um, after a while, uh, after living in abroad for a while, you kind of get to see your own culture and land with a kind of third eye, like a foreigner. So uh, after I came back, coming back from living in America and Netherlands, uh, we kind of start to look at our own country in very different eye because you know we we had to do our practice dealing with nature and then uh, we kind of look at the area where both Yunjin and I were born and also raised until we went to the United States to study. This is the area Gangnam. Maybe you, many of you are familiar with this uh, Gangnam from the the song of Sai, right? The, uh, so the Gangnam means southern part of Han River. So um, Gangnam is really a very highly developed area and one of the most expensive areas to live in Korea. So as you, as you see, we, we do have Han River in the north and the real mountains in the south, but we, didn't really, we don't really have uh, much, uh, let's say, park uh, spaces in, in the Gangnam area. 
So usually, you know, if you go to London or New York, one of those, one of all of those very high-end residential area usually have uh, their park nearby, right? Central Park and Hyde Park, those. So we were kind of wondering how how people in Gangnam, including Yunjin and myself, uh, could actually survive without park, right? Everyday life. So that's what we kind of start to look at uh, our own area, Gangnam then we were thinking maybe we have some kind of alternative way of getting experience of, experience of nature. Uh, because our ancestor, because our, the 70% of Korean peninsula are mountain. So all of my ancestors, their daily life is going to mountain or going to river, or just, you know, uh, stroll around. Uh, so they, they didn't really even have to make um, garden in their backyard because Korea is such a small and tight country and we always have mountain and river. So we didn't really have to have own enclosed uh, fake garden, fake nature. So this is one of the paintings that we really refer to whenever we have uh, opportunity uh, drawn by Kyungjae Jeong-san. So he actually go around, went around most of the country just depicting the landscape around. So obviously, uh, this, I believe, really show how Korean people lived with nature, uh, just looking at the nature and then just being there. Uh, so this is kind of Korean architecture. So for Korean traditional architecture, the location was really important rather than the design itself. So until it was not until 1960 that Korean architecture education taught facade design because the facade design was not the, pri uh, the prime thing to educate, but the location was more important. So um, that was how we start this, you know, the notion of alternative nature that uh, as a landscape architect, we're always trying to kind of design the experience of nature, even we don't really have any natural space available or even we, where we don't really have any green space available in a very haptic, uh, highly developed condition like Seoul. So through the, the term alternative nature, we really try to uh, create the, the experience of nature through artifacts. So sometimes the artifact doesn't even need to be green. So sometimes it's through stainless steel or aluminum uh, or just kind of reflective quality of any material that kind of remind people uh, of the experience of nature that they had within the nature. So in this book, there's also, so uh, William Lim of Singapore, who actually passed away last year, um, invited eight uh, architect and landscape architect from each country of Asia, and then um, asked them to discuss and write about their own city uh, in terms of the, the history of urbanism, um, because he believed that uh, how Asian cities have been urbanized is something that cannot be explained through the Western theory of urbanism. Um, so I wrote down the uh, name of the author who wrote about Bangkok, Kanika Ratana Pridaku. Sorry for my pronunciation, Do you, but you know who, who she is, right? Very famous architect. So she talked about Bangkok in the book. So I highly recommend you look at the book. So today, um, I'll be showing you like four projects that are built already about alternative nature and also how, what is alternative nature should be for year 2050. So year 2050 is the, the year that uh, EU is aiming to be um, carbon neutral. So uh, with this climate change and all this changing politics, policies, how landscape design needs to be also adapting. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about that po uh, portion with two other projects. And also, as uh, Ajahn Shusak mentioned, that we just won a competition last week about floating stage, uh, which also has a lot of all, all these kind of issues that are kind of uh, culminated into one project. So that's a kind of, this is kind of world premiere <laughs> for the project because I never really thought, it was last year and then this Monday it was officially announced. So uh, I'm happy to share the project. So the first one is, uh, CJ Blossom Park. So the name doesn't really uh, mean anything, but it's a uh, uh, R&D campus for the, the Korean conglomerate, the CJ Group. So here, our notion was um, making inspiring and restful natural setting within a city. So how do we create kind of experience of nature that are kind of relaxing and healing for the 
a researcher who worked there uh, from you know very early morning to the very late night because the campus usually the R and D campus for United States usually have like a huge land available and then uh, they they try to provide very um, recharging environment with a lot of green space but because it's really tight urban area we kind of try to uh, comp compact all those natural experiences within the uh, the urban setting so here um, so I think this is a good um, Example. So uh, the client wants us to create a reflection pond in front of the building, but the Korea is not really a Thailand that we only have very limited uh, period of year that water feature can be really functioning because in winter we have really freezing winter, so all the water features need to, need to be drained. Um, so for, for us, we, we had to re really think hard, what is the kind of essential quality of water that remind people uh, of the experience of water? So for example, like this, uh, this is just a random Google image. I don't know where it is, but when I type kind of reflection of water, it kind of one of the image that it g gave me. So for me, uh, what we can really, we cannot really um, have in the city is kind of this reflective reflection of really wide and deep body of water in the nature so we kind of try to um, uh, revive this kind of experience in the cj blossom park um, so this is how it got built so in front of the uh, main headquarter this is kind of roundabout where people can drop off the um, the important people and then the car uh, go away. So this is reflection pond, which which doesn't really uh, have water at, at this time. But this one is with water. So we were thinking because it's a reflection pond and there there will be people um, every day, not just summer. So we are thinking how do we make a reflection pond uh, something that is reflective when there is even no water. So uh, what I did, what we did was, I mean, of course, if, if there's a water, it will be reflective. As you see, the, all the facade and other um, quality are kind of um, also projected on the water. But uh, even when there's no water, there's still kind of this kind of reflective quality you can see. So for, for that, we, what we did was we used this um, materiality, like uh, we put the frame first because, oh, Something that I didn't mention. So even though they wanted us to design reflection ponds, um, we were brought in after all the architecture and um, the basement were already designed. So uh, we already were gi we only were given four centimeter to work with. So that was the deepest water I we could get. So four centimeter with water, but reflection reflective quality. Um, so I don't know why always landscape architects were given this hard, hard job, but that's what we uh, got. So what we did was we designed this um, aluminum and stainless steel frame first. And then we cut the stone into this uh, exactly same uh, shape. And then uh, we put this, you know, there's a gap between this frame because of this, you know, uh, the pedestal. And then because the, the edge is also shining and the stone surface is really highly polished, it has this double reflective quality that also makes this reflection point without water still uh, make a reflection. And um, just as a side note, this is the, oh, I'm sorry. This, uh, this design is actually from, the, so the CJ logo is like uh, composed with these three petals. You know the CJ is, uh, you, know, you know the Mama Award of K-pop? Every year, so the CJ is the company who uh, the host that kind of events, uh, but then they also have other industries as well, agriculture and food and everything. So um, this is how we use the material, and this is when the the water is fully filled with four centimeter depth. And then, the, as I mentioned, the seventy percent of Korea is mountainous, and then this is new city that are kind of carved out of uh, just mountain area. So there's uh, mountains and also, and also all the available flatter um, spaces are developed into apartment housing. So uh, of course this building is also surrounded by the mountain. So we try to make this roof garden as if it's kind of following that uh, remaining mountain ridge. And then also the view, uh, 
view uh, kind of beyond that landform is kind of uh, smoothly uh, continuing into the surrounding remaining mountain. And um, because there's so many mountain area, and people usually want to develop as much land as they can, so that's why usually at the edge of the property line, we usually got to have this very severely cut engineered slope. And this was how, how the site looked when we were uh, when we visited the site for the first time. Another very hard job. But then um, the CG really wanted to do something with the slope because that's the, so the chairman's office in the second floor, and this was the this would be the. Uh, seen outside of his window, so they really wanted to make it nicer. Uh, but we actually, what we did was we didn't just decorate the surface, but uh, because of the this is property line, of course, and then right right beyond the property line is a public park because um, they want to the city want to, wanted to develop the a flat land all for the kind of uh, housing development that make a lot of revenue. So all this like a very steep mountain area are designated as parkland, which is really funny, right? So what we did with the city and then CJ, we, we negotiated with both of them so that the city kind of giving up some of the land and then the CJ also gives some of the flood land to make this uh, much, much gentler slope. So that there's actually no border. So both the citizens who are climbing the, the withdrawing of mountain can actually come down and take a break. And also the workers from the building also can have this space much gentler so that they can actually use this space as uh, a, you know, the, a place rather than just civil engineered wall. And also when there's a rain, uh, it becomes kind of very ephemeral uh, cascade. And also because it's cut slope, uh, the structure is not very um, strong. So this kind of blade, we call it stone blade, really uh, help the ground to stabilize as well. So this is how it looked from the side. And we, uh, we made the that this a stone blade in, with a rhino model, so it was a cut uh, by CNC into the exact uh, shape. The second project is also about water, but we uh, is um, of course we also are trying to do the to try to make this reflective quality, but it's also sound of of uh, therapeutic sound because the, the, this was for. Um, training center for professional volleyball team of Hyundai owned by Hyundai, you know Hyundai company, right? So we try to make a kind of therapeutic landscape for the professional athlete uh, that they can take a really good break uh, when there's no game. So for this project also, uh, we brought in the very late moment when all the architecture um, design was already done. Uh, but so this was a site condition and the architect designed the exact square building. And what, uh, what we were given was just, we were just given freedom of make any program we want, but uh, they want us to make a water feature uh, again for this, for this um, project too. So what we did was we kind of make a juxtaposition with the building and also this water feature, but then we, we don't want to disturb this very peaceful uh, hilly landscape. So what we tried to do was we kind of make this water cascade as if we just peeled off the surface very gently, just following the contour line. So this is what we did, kind of three tiers of cascade peeled out of the slope. But then the, the material of the project is extended metal uh, because, you know, we we, I love all of my clients, but uh, they usually don't have enough money at the end. Um, so it's usually the same story and then very tight time as well, the, as well. So what we did was we went to the site one day and then we just really liked this material of the extended metal as a facade of architecture. And we were like, oh, why don't we try to use the material for the cascade as well? So that's why we use the same material for the cascade. So for the architect, the, the reason why they use the, uh, the aluminum, the extended metal is to kind of control the sunlight. Um, but then for, for us, 
because we also were given very short, very little amount of water that they can ever day use. Uh, but then because of this uh, different cut uh, phase of the aluminum extended metal, um, with very little amount of, of uh, amount of water, the reflective quality got really magnified because the water hit each uh, cut cut a surface, and then it uh, reflect the the, the the light really um, much more than the flat steel surface. So again, here we only had six millimeter um, thin water. Uh, but then it was the, the, the reflection quality was maximized by the extended metal. And there was three pedestrian bridge. So the title of the project was Pool of Riffles. So this is when there's no water, but, the, but then uh, time of sunset. So because there is no receiving water, uh, people um, feel like as if the, if the water is flowing or not, because usually at the end of water body, they're kind of recepting a pool, right? But instead we make really shallow area that recept the, recepting the, the receiving the, the water, but we make it deeper so that the sound of the falling water that hit the ground get magnified. So that people from, the, from apart, they can still uh, listen the sound of the water they're hitting the ground, but they don't really know where the water goes. So all this kind of trick is designed uh, by us. And I think this is the um, video. So without sound, uh, it looks really peaceful, but the sound is really big. Okay, so those two are what I meant by like alternative nature. So we, we, we use usually like a metals and those like steel, stainless steel, aluminum, those kind of material that usually Korean landscape architects don't really use. Um, so we don't particularly use those kind of so-called naturalistic uh, materials. But then what we are really focusing was how do we create the experience of nature, as if people, for example, like water body, uh, we got to try to make this reflective quality even without water in very harsh condition. But what about like uh, alternative nature for 2050? Is landscape architects still able to create those kind of experience as we do now? Um, because as I mentioned, 2050 is where European countries are aiming to be carbon neutral. So as we all know, um, as also many of the Thai landscape architects are saying, the climate change is real and then the climate is getting worse and worse and hard to predict. So that means it will be really just hard to uh, create this experience of nature without really thinking about uh, bringing back the function of nature. So that's what we are actually um, thinking in, re in relationship to the climate uh, change. So just uh, very briefly, this is the case of Korea. So in 2011, we had a really huge flood. It's actually the same year of Thailand, Bangkok flood, right? So. Um, when we are saying flood in Korea, it's not flood from river because the, all the rivers are totally controlled by all the deep dams and hydro, hydrological engineering. But when you say urban flood, it's kind of uh, flushing back to the road because of the, the lack of capacity in the underground system. So in the, this area is not a low-income area. It's a, one of the most expensive uh, residential area in Gangnam. But because of the you know, badly managed uh, infrastructure, even though the capacity is really big. Um, the 2011, because of the torrential rain, as you see, uh, it was very sudden um, that all the cars on the road were under the water. Um, so, you know, it's not that governments didn't do anything, but then mostly they did, what they did was just increasing the capacity of the underground infrastructure, just by hoping that uh, it will, um, contain all the water, uh, even no matter how big the rain is. But the thing is, uh, 2022, exactly the same area, the flood was even bigger. So that really tell us something that 
the gray infrastructure cannot uh, solve this problem alone anymore. So uh, yesterday, Azan Ken brought me to the Chao Phraya River boat uh, tour. And I saw many of the wall built after the flood, but uh, we just really think about if there's any way that green and blue infrastructure also can help um, the gray, infra gray infrastructure to actually really mitigate this uh, flood protection, the flood disaster. So what we are thinking is um, for year 2050, alternative nature cannot be really made only by playing with uh, unconventional materiality and the designer's imagination. I think we really work, need to work through increased biodiversity and water security and respecting the carrying capacity of the ground. So it looks, it sounds all very easy and conventional, but it's really hard to really do this thing in the real project because you always, clients have their own priority. Uh, it's not usually uh, ecology or climate change. So we need to really work really wise uh, to, uh, to, to achieve this kind of goals. But then because we're a designer, we're not an engineer or uh, ecologist, uh, we still need to provide the sensibility and pleasure being in landscape uh, because that's the responsibility of the designer. So I'm just going to show you two more projects that are built that we had that kind of uh, function, most functionality in our mind. So this is uh, the re renovation project of uh, a urban plaza of Gyeonggi Provincial Office. So Gyeonggi Province is the kind of biggest uh, province in Korea. Um, and then because they're so big, they have two different uh, government offices, and this is their north office. So usually when you say urban plaza, it's usually empty and just a hard pave everywhere. Um, so it doesn't really uh, do much in terms of ecology and subsurface. So here we're trying to design the drainage and everything that could actually at least uh, not making harm to the urban drainage. So this is previous condition, just one of those boring conventional uh, urban plaza in front of the municipality building, um, just paved with the, the granite. And this is how we renovated uh, the company in 2019. So uh, here, what we're trying to do in terms of the, the function of civic space, uh, is that when it's empty, usually because this kind of um, pavements uh, and very uh, boring planting, it looks really, uh, really empty, not very attractive, right? So what we're trying to do for the at the beginning is um, let's make a place uh, where it doesn't, which doesn't really uh, look boring, uh, but has still attraction uh, visually, uh, so that. It doesn't really look very cold or something, especially in the winter. So, uh, you know, all the cities of Korea usually carved out of mountains. So this city, Uijangbu, is also, they also lost a lot of mountain. So the pattern of the plaza is actually inspired by the lost topography of the, 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 the city. Um, but then it was really, as you see, it looks really complicated. And uh, landscape architecture, construction documents doesn't is not supposed to be just artistic drawing. So we really try uh, hard uh, to make it easier to uh, construct because in Korea nowadays uh, the construction workers sometimes they cannot speak in Korean, and um, if they cannot really build just by looking at our construction documents, then we feel that's a failure. So what we what we did was we made. Uh, we use only use one module of a ceramic tile that is 50 centimeter and 10 centimeter dimension, but two different color. And this is an eight different combination. So number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the workers just have their own numbered drawing. So they just need to find out this module and then put in a place. Then the to totality will look uh, like the, the plus I show you. So this is how we uh, made the construction document. And this is exactly what the, the construction workers got every day. So he, he received this number 74 drawing, and then this is the module, either one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they just need to uh, follow this numbering. So it's a, a work in progress in 2018. And this is how it looked. So it's the, the juxtaposition between the real mountain remaining and it's kind of the visual mountain, the contour. 
is something that uh, we wanted at the beginning, but uh, this contour is not just pattern contour. What we did was uh, the, the lowest looking area is actually really low area with only 3% fluctuation so that people would not feel it as if it was a sloped. They're sloped, but in terms of drainage, is sloped enough so that they can carry the water under the rain. So uh, here, what I meant was uh, drawn here. So we, uh, we researched the subterrain condition, the geology and the water table location, as you did uh, at the beginning, pen and pies drawing. I mean, they're drawing much deeper, but uh, we, we, this, so this is based on real data. Um, so as you see, this is what I meant. So all this area are slightly sloped, two to 3% slope. So um, the kids are having fun with skateboard and bicycles because it's slightly sloped, but it's not too steep that their parents need to be worried. And also when there's a rain, these are all lower catchment areas so the water will go into. And then uh, natural, because if they don't have underground parking space, which is really uh, fortunate. So it will be infiltrating into the subgrade so that it will finally recharge the water table. So this is how they use in the summer. Um, so they just put the, the cap at the nozzle so that the water can be uh, staying. Um, so those are really a popular water play area for the, for the, the children. So this is what I meant. So visually, this is a lower contour, but then it is really a lowest point. And in Korea, we don't really have, uh, people usually uh, don't distinguish plaza versus park. So when I go to public hearing, they're always saying, even though it is plaza, where's a tree? We need shade. Um, so what we did here was only planting the trees with um, at least a three meter canopy so that it, it will cast shadow to people as if it is park, but then all kinds of civic activities can be happening because it's high enough, the canopy is high enough. So we call it as urban forests that are kind of cooling and infiltration. So uh, just the uh, water circulation that we are imagining, when there's a precipitation, as I mentioned, because there's a, the surface are all continuously soaked uh, into the drain, uh, the water will be quickly moved into those lower area uh, so that we can actually aiming that the water would naturally infiltrate uh, to the surf surface. Because you know, in an urban area, usually the water table will just keep going down because people usually just ab abstract the water without recharging. Um, so here we hope that uh, this drainage pattern will actually continue to recharge the water table. So last project is the Yangha Riverfront. I think uh, the, many of the students Ken brought last January actually went, went there. So in Yangha Riverfront, we are actually really trying to bring the biodiversity and resilience to this concrete riverfront. So the project was a company 2011. Uh, we designed for two years, and then um, this is how we did. So, so just briefly to give you the, the history of the urbanization of Seoul. So Han River is 44 kilometer within Seoul, but in total is 250 kilometer. So it traverses the entire Korean peninsula. So um, before the urbanization until 1960, Usually every summer is flood into the center of Seoul. So, but then it was okay when there's not many people, but after urbanization, it caused a lot of problem, right? It's not safe and a lot of um, hygiene problem and things like that. So um, the president, Mr. Park at the time, uh, with a uh, cooperation of the mayor, Hyun Ho Kim, for both army, uh, very uh, macho man, so they decide to make this concrete dike all of the Han River so that it, it'll never get flooded, flooded, the city never get flooded. So from between 1970 to 2010, um, before our design get built, Han River, the Yangwa River front was looking like this. So Han River usually 3.2 meter, the, the water level, and there's a low water level, which is 3.3. So it will be sometimes on the water, but usually not. And then this is mid, mid water level, usually like a 6.2 or three. So sometimes under the water, heavy rain, 
Um, and then this is a high water level, which is like at 9.3 or 5, that are uh, rarely under the rain. But when there's a big, big uh, storm, it could be um, underwater, but city will try hard to uh, drain the water um, as soon as they can. So very harshly engineered water, waterfront that nothing to do with everyday life of uh, people. But then uh, the lifestyle of our Korean people got really quickly shifted once they are free to um, travel around the world. When they see the Seine River and the Charles River in Boston, they kind of aiming to have more friendly river, right? While they're still safe. So that made the politician of at the time really trying to uh, transfer the riverfront that is still safe but are more friendly. So this is what I meant. So especially after the flooding, um, water can be quickly uh, flood into, flush back into the river. But what's remaining is this kind of very thick mud on the river because Han River is totally controlled by dams up a stream. Only thing remaining on the riverbed is mud, no sand. So when the river bring this uh, mud with the flooding, uh, even after the water flush back to the river, this mud will remain. And because of that three terrace structure of the river riverfront, the, it will be really hard to remove the, it's always very hard to remove the, the mud, especially after 24 hours, because the mud will got uh, solidified as if it's really uh, uh, um, old pie crust, right? So a city also spends so much time and uh, money um, and machinery uh, to get rid of the mud. So the, our concept was, so this is before Yama Front, Yama River before. So when there's a flooding, the, river, the water will bring the mud also, but then the, when after water flush back to the river, the mud will remain because of the flat terrace structure. So what we did was we stretched out those uh, the steep area of the terraces and then make a series of slopes so that it will be actually easier for the mud to move back to the river when the water um, gets flushed back. So this is what it uh, was before and this is how it looks now. Um, and you know, as you see, there's only like these very steep stairs and it's not really universal. For example, like uh, young moms with um, push car or like disabled people with wheelchair uh, and women in high hill, they just could not get to the waterfront. But now there's the oldest paths are five percent, less than five percent. So all the riverfront is accessible by any kind of uh, all the citizens by any any condition. So this is under flooding in the summer, not not flooding flooding, but like a, you can see the water is up until like mid water level, and because of the seniors water edge. The, the edge will just continuously change its shape. And it looks really uh, so-called naturalistic, right? And with the background of the um, high rise and it's even more dramatic. So uh, this is the memory of my mom, for example. So she used to say that, okay, oh, I swam there in the summer in the sand beach. But then, you know, this is just a nostalgia of what we lost, but uh, theoretically, we, technically, we cannot really bring the sandwich back. But sometimes people still talking about politicians and some landscape architects still talking about let's bring back the sandwich to Han River, but uh, they know it's not possible. So when we cannot really bring back the lost sandwich, which is uh, impossible to reconstruct in the current hydrology, what we did was just make a rip wrap edge. That is, you know, not as soft as sandwich, but it could actually have uh, emerging ecology because the riprap has a lot of pores uh, between the, the boulders. So um, now we have, after the water, uh, kind of because of the water movement in and out, uh, the mud is kind of filling in the gap of the riprap. So uh, there's actually much more bird and fish now. Uh, because it's such a great habitat and uh, the place to hide. So now there's a mud beach. So a mud beach is actually maybe not very good for swimming, but it's actually more um, richer in terms of the ecology. So there are actually a lot of fish and birds are coming back. So this is what I mean by the bio biodiversity, I think, in the city. 
And the Yangon Riverfront is one of the very few uh, riverfront in Seoul that are still populated under the, under the rain. This is such a great uh, fishing uh, spot. And just very briefly, we also do this kind of very small uh, project as well. Um, this is again CJ ENM headquarters. It's about really um, experience. So because they have really tight lobby, uh, what we did was we really extended the interior to as if it's kind of stretched out into the forest area because they have big urban forest outside. And uh, this is one of the very high end residential that we designed last year. Um, in collaboration with architect Rafael Moneo. So um, what, what, what I try to say here is that the, the experience of nature or memory of nature is really changing by generation. So when, uh, when this kind of apartment housing in Kangnam, which is really expensive, uh, they were built in 1990s or 2000, early 2000, the generation who can afford to purchase apartment in Kangnam have this kind of memory of nature in their childhood because at that time, uh, there's a, not much urbanization going on. So they are so happy just to have this kind of mimicked uh, scene of water and pine tree forests uh, that are not really functioning as natural system. I mean, for example, like this kind of water, nothing to do with the drainage of the apartment. But uh, so this is, I, I would say this is kind of old style that we need to really um, act away from. And because the generation who are who can actually afford now this kind of expensive housing doesn't really have those memory of nature anymore. They're young and then they're in their 20s and 30s. So this kind of landscape design is not really working. And this is what happened like last year. All this like a super cars are under the water because the water system didn't really work. So what I teach at the GSD, um, we all, we, the, I always ask, like, a, as you see the Pen and Pies drawing, really think deeper into the ground. As, uh, even if you will be only drawing the section drawing, like two meter deep section after your graduation, you really have to think territorial scale. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it, how I do it, and with the floating stage design. But in, at the GSD, we, that's why we always encourage people to think territorial scale and then really zooming into into the, the, the site. So this is the um, surface runoff analysis of entire Antwerp when our site is here. So I encourage these two, two, two students to study through the ArcGIS to really um, see the surface runoff. And then this is how they come up. Their design idea is this um, underground highway is also working as water highway. I, I wouldn't really go into too much detail because um, we are running out of time. Okay, so last part, this is the competition that we won last week. Um, I'm so happy that I can be here with a really happy mind. If I lost this competition, maybe I'll be a really sad person here today. So um, this was the uh, floating stage competition. Um, so um, we compete with two other architects, um, Fernando Menis, a Spain architect, and uh, James Carpenter, a US, uh, US architect. Both had really good portfolio of uh, great performing hall and an outdoor stage. Uh, so we're the only um, landscape architect who were invited to the competition. And this is, uh, so this lake is located in Daegu, uh, it's, an, it's two hours from Seoul, southern part of uh, South Korea. And um, just give you the dimension, this is like 800 meter, this is 500 meter. So in total, it's like a, about two kilometer if you go around. And um, this is north, of course, and south. And this used to be an architect, uh, agricultural reservoir that was built in 1927 by a Japanese uh, farmer when Korea was under uh, Japanese colonization. So our title was Floating Hills. So the, the lake is quite beautiful. Uh, it's really horizontal. And usually in Korea, as you see from the Yanghua Riverfront, landscape architects always have to deal with the fluctuation of the water. But here, uh, very excitingly, the water, the level doesn't change. So we just got to work with very peaceful and flat surface, reflective surface. Also, it doesn't get really frozen because Daegu is the warmest city in Korea. So what we uh, saw here was first this 
layers of mountain as a backdrop of the lake, and also that the water level, the water surface, horizontal beauty of the water surface that doesn't really fluctuate. Um, and then, but the thing is, the people really love coming here, just, but then it's only like a circling around. There's actually nothing to do, and then no gathering space. So we really, we really think hard what kind of stage that the Suzong Lake needs. I and mean, we, we can we agree that it would be nice to have new stage because Daegu uh, is famous for having a lot of concerts. It's the only uh, city um, other than Seoul that has opera house in Korea. So that tells something. But so the, the, the thing is what kind of stage? Because you know the architects, two architects maybe will come up with beautiful structure that's floating in the lake. So as a landscape architect, what, what should we do? So we uh, start by uh, precedent study uh, from the antiquity to the very present time. So as you see, this some of the Roman and Greek um, um, precedents have um, very steep audience area, but then very fixed relationship between the stage and audience. But then there's more like a recent examples have more dynamic and um, a flexible relationship, especially like if you go to the Hangzhou Westlake uh, stage, the performance kind of uh, performing as if they're on the water, but because of the stage is kind of three centimeter below the water surface, um, that really give very unique uh, experience. So after all this uh, study, and also we did like a re really look at the Daegu. So this is what I mean by territorial scale, even if we only uh, design this lake. So this is the map of 1930 before the urbanization of Daegu. So there are so many lakes were there, but now only two lakes are remaining. And this is the urban heat island map of Daegu, which is the warmest city in Korea. So we are thinking, what if all this reservoir were not filled or buried through the, to build apartment housing? What if they're all there so that they can cool the air uh, in the summer? So that's kind of uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, that why don't we make this water body even more contributing to this warm climate? Of course, they need to function as a stage. So this is old photo that are published in Life magazine in 1950. So this is Suzong Mode from north to south. So this is the wind corridor through valley that are starting like a hundred kilometers southern part of Daegu. So as you see, Suzong Mode is located at the kind of end of the wind corridor. So we are thinking, okay, maybe the wind when it arrives here at the corner of Suzong Mode, uh, it could be really strong. And especially the summer, the wind blow from south and southeast, and this the wind corridor. Uh, it is actually actually coming from southern east. So we did this environmental analysis just to see uh, which er which corner of Suzong Mall has the strongest wind in the summer. So obviously, where the wind corridor is going through, and with this side, um, is where Suzong Mall gets the strongest wind in the summer. Because we we are not given the location of the stage. We need to find out the best location of the stage within the, the lake. So that's why we kind of decide where to, where to put the stage. So there's a one uh, existing island we call Tungji Island that are already acting as kind of ecological hub of the lake. So we and then the how they originally built this Suzong Mode is by putting embankment at the north south, northwest edge of the lake. So this is still kind of more artificial area when this is more naturalistic edge condition with island. So we um, decided to put this stage, new stage, at the other corner of uh, the island area. But then it's not just one structure. This is actually a stage and it's surrounded by eight uh, landforms that are connected to the embankment. So this is how it look from um, northwest corner to the southeast. So we have two stage. This is a wet stage and this is main stage. And then these are surrounded by um, eight landform. So in, in the plan, um, as I mentioned, we have two different stage. 
So in the wet stage, the water can be um, filled if they need to have like water-related performance. And this is main stage, which can be also filled with water, but it doesn't have to be. And um, this, uh, these three are main sitting that accommodate 1,200 people. That was kind of given by the clients. And then these are more like a relaxed, casual seat where like a Boston Tanglewood music festival, you can actually lie down and having picnic and then just casually listen to the music. Uh, and then because of the planting, um, we simulate the, we, we make analysis of this, the climate, microclimate simulation. And this area will be uh, three, three Celsius temperature lower than before in the summer. So in terms of structure, we designed this high hybrid concrete, concrete slab. So that what, that what that is, is FLP mold, the concrete will be poured into and it's solidified within. And then there's a six meter grid system already piled into the subgrain, subterrain. And then the precast slab will be just brought into the site so that the disturbance to the natural ecology will be minimized. At the same time, because the concrete will be within the FRP, the risk related to the humidity and the water will be minimized too. Just to show the structure. And the, just simply the landform. So the embankment level is 676, and the water level is 74.4. And we made this terrain um, steep enough so that the, the, the head of the, the person who's sitting in front of you wouldn't block your view. But still, uh, we provide this 8% uh, path for everyone so that even wheelchair can actually come into uh, near to the stage. So as I mentioned, just dealing with non-fluctuating water body was a luxurious experience as a landscape architect in Korea. So we really celebrate the horizontal beauty of the water so that all the structure, including the building, we try to make it really horizontal. But then within the horizontality, those structures, they need to be vertical. They're kind of dancing between the water level and the, the mountain. Um, so in terms of the circulation, uh, we are just using the existing circulation for both car and the pedestrian. Oh. And then just quickly, the circulation will be uh, when they get to the admission point, um, they can just follow the edge of each landform and then naturally going into their own seats. And then there's a separate vehicle accessibility going to the stage for loading. And as I mentioned, there are three kinds of seats. These are fixed seats, and these are more relaxed park seats. And then when there's so many uh, guests, we can empty the water of the wet stage, and then we can bring the chair to seat uh, 650 more people. And because of stage, you know, we need to make the AV system. But for the outdoor concert, uh, the company we work with, they said, no matter what you do in terms of structure, they need to be amplified. So what we did was we minimized the permanent audio system um, because, you know, to, to minimize the maintenance. But then this four theoretical, theatrical tower is where the mount, the speaker and lighting and um, the amplifier, they will, uh, will need to be mounted there. And so this permanent facility, but then depending on what kind of uh, performance are there, this kind of temporary system will be just brought in. And then we also design all this acoustics and um, AV system with a company called Charcoal Blue in America who uh, collaborate, with, collaborate with Heatherwick for the Little Island Amphitheater. So we're talking about just the temporal, temporality and the flexibility of the water feature, the stage. So we can fill the both stage with water and we can also drain out the both stage so that it can be, you know, water play area in the summer 
and also ice skating for the winter because you know we can now use the stage for 365 days in, in Korea only like five months of the year um, the stage will be utilized so our strongest concept was to use this area as park so that uh, when it's really hot the people can just come out and enjoy being at the water the waterfront because there's a no structure any kind of um, show or set can be designed and then this is when both stages were filled with water and then the lighting scheme um, so usually the the in the normal days the seat, the led light or the, along the seat will be lit and then when there's a concert um, the top lighting from the theater, theatrical tower and then the, the other seat will be lighting will be dimmed off There's just some more images and then this is how the the three line form with a fixed seat are looking with this mountain as a backdrop this is one of the autumn days with very cold and clear air and we wanted the stage both stage and seating to be part of the landscape and because the city is really really hot we installed the water mist at the back of the, each seat um, and also we designed the, the water circulation system as well so that um, people and tree and grass is all part of the water system We also even designed a fence um, with the 10 centimeter interval so that when wind blow through the fence uh, it will be immediately cooled down so that the, the, the microclimate of the path is actually uh, more comfortable in the summer. And if you want to be alone in the park you can by uh, choosing the seat um, kind of uh, uh, get back, back to the stage. Um, but then still very safe because in the, in the middle of the city. I mean, it rarely snows in Daegu, but because it is really uncommon, we hope people can get unforgettable uh, scenery when they come to this lake. The really on the hands, all the facilities. I think we can play the video for the ending. So we have one and a half, one, one minute and half, a 30, 30 second video just to show the, the stage. We don't have any music. <clears throat> So we are, we are reaching the embankment level and then going to the water side, waterfront, through the, the um, park seat area. You can see people picnicking. And then um, near the water, you can see the, the school can come out and then for the outdoor class. And this is the wet stage. And uh, we are kind of climbing up to the highest point. And then there will be like community busking at any point of the seats when there's no concerts. Heading toward the stage again. I mean, um, any kind of concert can be happening here, like uh, uh, opera and everything, but also K-pop, for example.
So I think this project really has everything in it, like our uh, concern about climate change and also making the, um, the experience of nature in the city uh, and things like that. So hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. inspiring uh, lectures, especially the process of thinking about as a design. And before we go forward for the Q&A sessions, uh, I would like to invite our team uh, to take the photos and everyone <laughs> can give a gift for you. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for next time, we, I would like to invite our own faculty member, Dan Ken Jongsuwa. He will continue doing this Q and A session because over the year our uh, optional studio at India has traveled to Seoul and can have uh, Professor Yuni is as uh, co instructors of our studio, and this is a time when she come back to Bangkok and including uh, this lecture, uh, including reviewing uh, in her studio. So please welcome Madam Ken. Thank you, Jimmy, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, I think uh, well, most of us, all of us, really enjoyed it. Uh -huh. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, well, first of all, thank you uh, for, you know, agreeing to come to the university. And, you know, the, I keep re reiterating with the students how lucky they are in having a really esteemed, talented, multi faceted designer and uh, educator uh, with us, and you were able to work really closely with them. I also want to thank the faculty at INDA, uh, Dr. Chusak and the Dean, uh, for, for putting us, connecting us together, and it's an honor to uh, work closely with you. Um, so I think the idea here is we, we kind of open up for some questions, uh, maybe from, from the crowd, and also maybe some of my own questions. Uh, so if, if anyone has uh, burning thoughts, uh, feel free to, to ask. And if not, I can start with maybe some of my questions. <laughs> There's already some questions. Okay. That's enough. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing with us session on wonderful nature and um, beautiful projects. I think everybody here also me really um, excited to see you know, all the process that you have shared with us um, and uh, I think it's really amazing to see that you know we really um, dig deep into those natural um, elements right like you study terrain study hydrology right those kind of things wind analysis which is you know being uh, such a wonderful design uh, I actually have two questions so the first one you know will be about maybe you know, as you are a um, professor and um, working in academic and professional, uh, could you suggest us, you know, how to balance between nature and design? Yeah. Nature and design. Yeah, how yeah. to balance nature and design in every project. You know, what's, what's your thoughts on that? And, you know, please suggest us. Maybe it would be useful for the students here. And the second question. Um, I'm also landscape architect and also graduate from here. Yeah, um, these days we know that you know, climate change is a very pressing issue, right? And yeah, I'm really um, fascinated by the, the new term that you are raising today, like alternative nature. Um, in the condition of Korea, right, um, climate neutral, neutral policy, 
what what did they have these days? Uh -huh. Yeah, and how that also impact to the way you work as landscape architect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so let me ask the second question first. So um, I think. Um, I think Jem left, right? Uh, yeah, okay, he just left. Mm -hmm. So when Jem was working as an intern in my office, it was 2013. So um, we, he, he did a great job uh, in for the, one of the competitions at the time. He was uh, making a park um, on the site where previously there was a thermal uh, power plant in Korea, right near the river. Uh, but then government is trying to put it underground because uh, community work just keep complaining to having uh, thermal power plants on the ground level. They were blocking their um, circulation toward the accessibility to the river. Um, so what we, are, what we did was, because it was previously thermal um, plants, so we thought that the park should be something that are that is kind of symbolizing the history of the site at the same time, really addressing the issue of climate change. So we did kind of similar thing, like a, you know, outdoor comfort simulation and how to create the landform in a way that the microclimate was a little bit comfortable, and then making the the period of the time of the year that people can actually be outside is elongated. But it was 10 years ago, and none of the jury members even understand what we were trying to do, in, right? So the, the term climate change was not even common. And then they, of course, uh, didn't thought, didn't think that it, is, it's even, um, it could be even concept or landscape design. But we won this competition, the Susan uh, Lake competition. And uh, I think jury really appreciated the fact that we uh, did all this analysis um, to to uh, conform the location of the stage, you know, the, you know, such a um, priceless remaining the body of water in the city, because the city is the warmest city of the Korea, of course. So we we see that in, in at least in the professional world in Korea, it is really changing. And then um, the climate change, the people think the climate change is real, uh, but then unfortunately not really in the policy level yet. People think people talk about climate change, but um, I don't think anything has been really done. So hopefully, the design of Susan Lake uh, stage um, could actually make a kind of breaking point uh, because it is public uh, public project, and it has been getting a lot of spotlights because um, there's a lot of famous foreign names were invited, <laughs> not because of us, but now that they won the competition, hopefully, oh, there will be bridge also. Uh, kind of uh, landing near the lake. So that competition was done parallelly, and that, that competition was in won by Junior Ishigami. So uh, he's really helping us to be more getting more uh, famous <laughs> because they always make this uh, press material with our name and Junior Ishigami. So anyway, so hopefully the project can contribute the public awareness of the, the climate change and also in, uh, also politicians and policymakers. And the first question is the balancing between nature and design, right? So um, at the beginning, I mentioned that the professional landscape architects starting by mimicking the nature in the, in the city. But then, um, as I mentioned also, we don't really have uh, much land left in the city area all over the world. So for example, we, we don't really have a uh, condition of Frederick Lawrence that when he had huge amount of uh, the land available in New York City. I mean, not that I'm saying it was an easy job for him, of course, but um, we just have different conditions now to uh, create this outdoor space. So I, I don't know, I don't really have an answer, but the thing is my approach is making this alternative nature, but then, um, as I said, the creating natural experience of nature um, it will be only getting hard because we cannot really uh, predict uh, the climate um, anymore. I mean, in Korea, we had really distinctive four seasons before, but now we have really short spring and fall. We have really a long summer now. So last summer, I think it was even harder than Bangkok, the summer. Um, so winter can be sometimes very cold and sometimes too warm. We just, that's, we just don't know. So I think that's something that we all need to figure out all together. I think Thai landscape architects are already doing great. I mean, some of the ones I know. 
Um, so um, I don't know if even the word balancing is even um, working anymore because nature is something um, that we've been ignoring so much that it's kind of attacking us back um, for what we've been uh, doing to it. So I, I, I really don't have any answer, sorry, but this is what the approach we've been making. Hopefully, um, I can uh, find some answer next time I come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe one of my own questions. Um, we, you know, in this room we have landscape architects, we have architects, we have students. Um, in the couple of, of the first projects, uh, you mentioned that the landscape architect comes after the architecture is maybe done <laughs> most of the time, right? Uh, but I noticed in the later projects, somebody's shift uh, has become the landscape. We even won a competition. Ah, uh, yes. A landscape architect won a couple, uh, over a couple mm. architects, right? So in terms of the profession, do you see kind of a shift, especially with climate change uh, and the, mm. uh, the piggyback on uh, the last question? Mm. Uh, and how the world of landscape architects has maybe become more prominent? Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. Um, so, yeah, so actually that competition really means a lot to us because it doesn't, it didn't, it was really a rare opportunity that uh, wasn't this distinguished, distinguished as either architectural project or landscape mm -hmm. project because usually we are brought into a project as a landscape architect mm -hmm. with uh, usually the building designs or site planning are all done. Um, so we had to try a lot, for example, for CJ Blossom Park, all the uh, mechanics and you know, vent uh, location and duct location were already set. But what we did was uh, we really modified the form and location of the duct and vents according to our landform design. So we had to have a lot of fighting, <laughs> really, um, to really achieve that. But then for this project, uh, that kind of distinction between the disciplines didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But of course, the the city thought that the stage is something that usually architect designed. Mm -hmm. So that's why they brought this two very famous architects from abroad, and then we are the only landscape um, company that brought into. But I think uh, what we can do actually, uh, what we did um, that made us win the competition is that we really tried to um, understand the land and air and the community that use the, the lake every day. Um, and then for example, the location, in terms of location, even though the, we are not given, we have, we were not given specific location, um, the two architects just follow the location of the existing stage at the, red, at the center of the, the, the site. So I'm mean, not that, not that I want to try, I want to say someone is better than others, of course, but uh, I think the strength of landscape architect uh, is that uh, we always work with the land mm -hmm. and the air, and um, and also we can um, work multi-scale too. So we can also think about uh, territorial scale, and also we think about garden scale. So that's the strength of the landscape profession, I think. Um, so. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, did I answer your question? I don't know. No, yes. Uh, oh, uh, I... Does have a question? Yeah. Uh, I think you, the, the last project is very interesting. And when you talk about location, this is very different approach from the habitat in choosing location. And I guess the analysis at the larger scale, like a thermal map, Right, and also the wind probably uh, become a, a major factor that you choose the location. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And I just like you to explain a little more about the role of this winding and also mm -hmm. the thermal conditions. That did you choose the location based on that, or like you choose the, the hottest one to make it cooler, or you choose the cooler one to make it comfortable? Also, in the winter, uh, would that wind play a role? Because uh, in terms of thermal conditions, the thing that landscape architects can manipulate is the wind, wind speed yeah. and uh, humidity. I see the details showing the humidity. 
could you explain a little more? So sure. this is a very interesting mm -hmm. because uh, landscape architects in Taiwan you face the same problem because we are very high. Okay. Can we have the slide back the, of the the product? I mean, thank you, Shusak, for the question. I kind of skipped some of the explanation because I was already going over one hour. <laughs> I hate long lectures. So. <laughs> Um, uh, can you make a, a some slide before? Can, could you can, could you show me the thumbnail? I don't know the number. Further up up. A bit more. <laughs> a bit more. <laughs> A bit, a bit more. Yes. So yeah, yep. Seventy-four. Yeah. Maybe we can. You, you don't have to do the first screen. So that you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um. So that's a wind corridor, right? So if you go to next slide. Oh no, no I can I can do it. Um, because so when we so there's actually many factors that we consider for the. For the location. So, first of all, so as I mentioned, when the uh, when the Japanese uh, farmer create this um, agricultural reservoir, um, it was 1927. They the city of Daegu trying to so this used to be so there's a river flowing this side west of the the site Hoshinchan. So Xinchan used to be source of the agricultural water. Uh, the farmer can always use that water. But then when the population of the city got increased, then city trying to use the river water only for the drinking water and everyday uses, not the, for the agriculture. So the, the farmer made a kind of community organization to uh, secure enough water for the agriculture because at that time the main industry of the city was agriculture. So that's why they create this reservoir to contain and uh, secure the water, enough water for the farming. Because there's a water also runoff from the mountain, this is the embankment that they made at the northwest side of the, um, the, the reservoir. So it is more, making more sense we, if we build anything along this embankment because it's already very structurally sound because this edge is more naturalistic edge. So that was number one, that we do something um, here, not here. And also this uh, island is artificial island, but then uh, from, it's kind of uh, working as ecological stepping stone between the Xinchan River and the Bomochan River. So all this like a uh, fish is actually having this island as a stepping st uh, stopping point when they uh, kind of migrating from this river to this river. So we don't want to mess around around this area. And this is really shallow area. So usually the fishes prefer shallow area rather than the deeper. This is the deepest seven meter dip. This is one or two meter dip. So that's why we're trying to do something, anything, any construction in this corner. Then also we had this uh, strongest wind in the summer. And Shusok said, I think you got a really uh, critical point. So, wind blow from southeast in the summer, which is uh, the kind of same direction from the, the wind corridor. So you can see this wind from the, the southeast. So this is prevailing wind direction in the summer. So, uh, from also by help with the wind corridor, that's why this north west corner is getting the strongest wind in the summer. But in the winter, um, the prevailing wind direction is from west. So that means this landform will make this center area as kind of warmer corner because the landform will actually uh, block the wind from west. So the landform is really working with wind, wind direction in the summer, but against the wind in the winter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions?
you have one in the front. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I'm very interested in the um, Yanghua Riverfront project. Um, I really admire the balance between the ecology, but also the culture and how people um, use the landscape. Um, maybe I'm a bit uh, curious uh, in the beginning process of like unfolding um, the, mud uh, the mud infrastructure. Um, what I wonder, what I was wondering is, uh, which one comes first in the process? Um, is it the government wanting to renovate this riverfront, or is it your research on the um, temporal um, changes of the mud uh, that initiates uh, this project? Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, governments usually would never <laughs> come up with those kind of ideas. I mean. <laughs> Of course, they initiate the project, but kind of the, the trend of at that time transforming the riverfront is to just turning some um, civil engineering work to so-called park, right? So that people can have picnic or you know soccer or basketball. Uh, so thinking about ecology or climate is not even in their agenda. Because it's you know usually it's step by step they don't really make two or three step ahead right so but then for for us the the decoration on the surface wasn't really interesting enough so um, that's why we um, bring this um, idea of management maintenance cost so government of Seoul was was spending um, um, every year five hundred thousand. USD every year only to remove the mud uh, from the riverfront. So we are saying there's a lot of money to spend only to manage the mud. So after the construction, it is only 10% of that amount. I mean, they still need to clean up, but the maintenance cost hugely reduced. Um, so it's actually for, for, for us to really come up with concept. And we are actually lucky also in a way that uh, in, around the Yangwa River, we didn't have major gas line or something. So that's why we were able to modify the sectional topography rather than just dealing with the surface. So it was our concept, but then, you know, it's funny, we never really um, explained this project to government in a way that I'm explaining to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think we are using really kind of rhetoric, political term at the time <laughs> to, to explain what we're doing, to, to convince them to let us to do what we want to do. So I don't think we even mention the mud problem to them. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't, you don't have to explain your project <laughs> in one way. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> maybe, maybe perhaps uh, to continue that conversation with, I think, uh, what you mentioned uh, that the politicians were ex-military, right? uh, so yeah, very yeah. rigid, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to maybe pull that into some parallels uh, on our site, uh, Jamia River. Uh, as you have experienced, there's a different typology altogether uh, compared to Yamal River. So I wonder if you see some of these opportunities, um, possibilities, and maybe parallelities uh, between the two rivers and. Mm. The idea of public space. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I try not to talk about um, other country situation with very shallow knowledge, really. Uh, I mean, the Yangwa at the time in 1960, it was really, my country was really governed by the ex uh, general, the President Park, and also uh, Mr. Kim Hyun uh, who was also ex military. But now the, the politicians in Korea, they rarely are from army. So it's really different uh, situation. But I think there's also kind of so-called, let's say, beauty of those really like a high modernist. The you know, high modernist is the one who really believed in uh, technology and using really the technology to really rule uh, the country. So really modifying nature is one of the high modernists uh, tool, not just in Korea, but like a Singapore and China, and almost same like a similar like a Mao Zedong of China, of China and Park Jong in Korea and Ri Kan of Singapore. They're all kind of high modernists, really trying to modernize their country by greening and uh, building infrastructure. 
So that's the kind of um, uh, paradigm of at that time. So I don't want to really um, criticize because, you know, um, Korea at that time was poorer than North Korea. Hard to believe, right? One of the poorest country. So um, I think they did their best uh, in their city, uh, in, the, in, the, in their time. Uh, but uh, time changed. So uh, I think what you're, what you're doing now is really valuable. And I know the students are really trying to uh, look at how people who actually live along the river are affected by all, by all these like, building walls and everything. Um, so I'm sure in 1960 and 70 in Korea also, though, I, I think there must be those students who, who like this in the students really looking at alternative way of dealing with river and flood. So I think the, uh, my work we are doing now is kind of accumulation of those trial and error that has done before. And I think we are just building upon um, opponents. So I think the ro ro of, role of uh, academy that Shula and Inda is doing is exactly what you're supposed to do. Perfect. Great way to, to conclude. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have one time for squeeze in one question and then we, we have to break okay, from the back. Last one. So one of our Inda students. Hi, so thank you very much for the lecture. My question would be, um, as you previously mentioned, we don't have a lot of land left and we're experiencing a lot of urbanization. My question would be, as a designer slash architect, how would we give back to nature? How would we restore the ecology back into a form where it no longer requires extensive human assist, uh, human service and maintenance. Yes, um, thank you. <clears throat> so you know, um, so I think so. Be before when uh, our um, so like a the um, Freddie Longstead or um, the the prior generation, when they're working as a landscape architect or architect, um, I mean, of course, other conditions were maybe worse than now, but at least they had uh, some land to work with, right? And the climate was not as harsh. So now, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, we are dealing with really tight condition, and there's so much to uh, intervene underground as well. I mean, usually water table are getting lower and lower because we are uh, we are uh, extracting so much of underground water. So, for example, like in in Korea, we have this Samsung Dong area where the 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 coax and intercontinental ocean and everything is kind of happening together. Um, there's always like a three subways are going up from like going across from the minus hundred to minus twenty five. So imagine. How much of underground water are every day being losing because the construction itself are already uh, disturbing the groundwater underground. So government of Seoul using uh, putting a hundred ton of tap water every day to recharge the underground water, groundwater. Because if the groundwater uh, layer got emptied, that means the structure of the ge geology will be weakened, so the ground will be collapsing. So government of Seoul putting hundreds ton of tap water, <laughs> drinking water, to fill the gap. And then there's another huge construction going on designed by Dominique Perot uh, to build underground transit system. So in a way, um, we are talking about climate change and abstracting uh, underground resources and what we do. But on the other hand, other group of architects and designers and policy makers are still um, extracting our resources and nature without really thinking about it with totally different agenda. So I think um, in education, for example, I think we really try to teach um, underground as well. There is, uh, there is, they're not visible, so that it's really easy to uh, ignore. Um, and on the other hand, we, I think need, we need to uh, make a venue where the related profession always talk about our project and then what are the concerns that we each have uh, so that I think this kind of agenda needs to be kind of common agenda rather than just happening in academia um, so that 
we can actually deal with very thin line of land, but it's not like horizontal and wide, but deeper and vertical, um, so that we really um, think about nature in a more holistic way, rather than just planting tree on the, on the ground or anything. Thank you. I think that's a great way to conclude. <laughs> I think uh, nature has a holistic yes. uh, partner. I think is a is a great you know um, way to end the lecture. And thank you again uh, for for uh, thank you very sharing much. your work. Thank you, very much. thank you for thank being you. such a warm host and so and me and the students together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>